hello everyone and welcome. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Rahul Shah, Mobile for Development Director for the Asia Pacific region at the GSMA. Uh, just last week, Bangladesh celebrated the momentous 50th anniversary of its independence. We wish the country much peace, progress, and prosperity in the years to come, where digital will be a key enabler of the economy and society. Bangladesh is one of the first countries in the region to de define and pursue a digital vision. The country has made tremendous progress towards a digital Bangladesh, but more needs to be done. We've convened this dialogue today to discuss how Bangladesh can realize its aspirations of being an inclusive digital society for all Bangladeshis. We have an excellent lineup of speakers who represent a diversity of viewpoints. I would like to welcome Brigadier General Naseem Parvez, Director General of the Systems and Services Division of the Bangladesh Telecommunication Regulatory Commission, Anir Chaudhary, Policy Advisor, Aspire to Innovate, Anju Mangal, Head of Asia Pacific for Alliance for Affordable Internet, Atsuko Okuda, Regional Director for Asia and the Pacific at the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, Madhabuddin Ahmed, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Robbie Axiara Limited and President of AMTOP, Mr. Shahbuddin, Managing Director of Teletalk Bangladesh Limited. Jens Becker, Acting Chief Executive Officer of Grameen Phone Limited. Daimur Rahman, Chief Corporate and Regulatory Affairs Officer, Bangalink Digital Communications Limited. Mohammed Mesbauddin, Chief Marketing Officer at Fair Group. And finally, Brigadier General SM Farhad, retired, Secretary General of AMTOG. Uh, may I invite all speakers to, I think we already have all the cameras on, so perhaps, uh, uh, Christina, if you can take a photo of, uh, of all the speakers, and who will now uh, join me in welcoming His Excellency, the Minister for Post and, Telecommunic Minister for Post and Telecommunications Division, uh, Mr. Mustafa Jabbar. Christina, let me know when we can move on. Yes? Uh, please move on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let me introduce the GSMA and the National Dialogues. Uh, the GSMA represents the interests of mobile operators worldwide, uniting more than 750 operators and nearly 400 companies in the broader mo mobile ecosystem. And funded by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, CEDA, the GSMA's National Dialogues help countries to achieve their SDG commitments by bringing together key government ministries mobile industry leadership, and the development community to demonstrate how mobile can be a positive force for societal change. Today, we are launching our report on achieving mobile-enabled digital inclusion. Sam, can you please paste the link in the chat box? It should be showing for everybody now. Okay, thank you. So the link to the report is now available. Uh, my colleague Leila will shortly be presenting on the findings of the report, so I won't go into that right now. I just have a few housekeeping points before we begin. This event is being recorded. Everyone, please mute your audio and video unless you're speaking. Uh, post any questions that you have in the chat box. So this is for the audience, uh, including the name of the person it is directed to. Uh, for some reason, if due to paucity of time, we are unable to answer your question. You can later email it to me at rsha at gsma.com. I'll post, uh, Kevin, if you can post that, please. And then we will get you a response later from the presenter or panelist. Uh, and I would just like to now thank everyone who is in attendance and members of the press as well. Uh, I will invite Leila now to uh, present the key findings of the report. Leila, over to you. Sorry, uh, are we having? I think Leila has a slight connection issue, but if you just bear with us one second. 
we should be able to. Okay. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Leila. Okay. And can you see my screen? The presentation on the screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. Perfect. So good morning and good afternoon. My name is Leila Nesbitt Ahmed, and I'll be taking you through the findings of the new GSMA report called Achieving Mobile Enabled Digital Inclusion in Bangladesh. Now, the report aims to do three things, to look at the impact of mobile technology on Bangladesh's development aspirations, highlight the role of digital inclusion in meeting socioeconomic goals in Bangladesh through two key areas, coverage and usage, and finally, to provide recommendations to close both the usage and coverage gaps in Bangladesh. The internet digital and digital technology drives socioeconomic growth. And mobile remains the primary means of internet access and the principal form of digital technology use. Digital technologies uh, will Lila, be crucial uh, to uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I don't think we are seeing your slides. Oh, okay. Let me know if you can see them. Yes, we can see now. I'll just um, go from the top. Um, so my name is Leila and I'll be introducing um, the findings of the new report that Rahul previously mentioned. So the report aims to do three things. We had three objectives, which was showing the impact of mobile technology on Bangladesh's development aspirations highlighting the role of digital inclusion in meeting socioeconomic goals in Bangladesh through two key areas, coverage and usage, and providing recommendations to close both the usage and coverage gaps in Bangladesh. So what were some of the key facts that we uncovered? That the internet and digital te technology drives socioeconomic growth, and that mobile remains the primary means of internet access and principal form of digital technology used in Bangladesh. Digital technologies and mobile in particular will be crucial to meeting Vision 2041, the SDGs and the eighth, the eighth five-year plan. And because of the importance of mobile technology, there is a need to enhance digital inclusion to maximize mobile tech's impact on, on the government's development aspirations. Some of the mobile market indicators from the report include 170 million connections serving 90 million unique subscribers, 102 million internet connections serving 47.1 unique subscribers, and mobile technology Leila, and services. Leila. Yes? Apologies, but we are still on the on the title slide here. We're not able to, ah, uh, there we go. I won't um, share it in the Leila. wider screen. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so some of the key findings. And, please, uh, uh, and, and, and maybe, maybe Lila, you can uh, use the slideshow mode. Uh, on the bottom of, the, of your screen, you can click the it slideshow wasn't, mode. Wasn't it's right. mode. I think that's why you couldn't see it. No, no, no. We can see your slide, but but it's not in the presentation mode. You see? I, I uh, think on the, the presentation board. mode is what's freezing the um, rotation for for the rest of the participants. So this might be the only way to see the current slide as Layla scrolls through them. Okay. Um. So mobile technology and services contribute 16 billion to the economy, which is equivalent to 5.3% of GDP. Now the report also looked at the use cases for mobile and how it's contributing to Bangladesh's development aspirations by mapping mobile's potential on socioeconomic development in Bangladesh to its corresponding eighth five-year plan category and the related SDGs. So you can see there's quite a broad range of things that mobile contributes to economic growth, agriculture, health and education, digital Bangladesh and ICT, 
gender equality, disaster management, and it also stimulates participation for persons with disabilities in many areas of education, employment, and social life. We previously mentioned usage and coverage, and now we go into more details on the gaps in, these report, in the report. So the usage and the coverage gaps, what does that look like in Bangladesh? 4G networks cover 95% of the population. But out of that 95%, two-thirds of the population that are covered by mobile broadband networks do not yet use these services, and that's the usage gap, so it's at 67%. The coverage gap shows that 5% of the population is not covered by mobile broadband networks. Now, what is the main issue? What is leading to this? The main issue is that, as we've previously said, 4G networks cover around 95% of the population in Bangladesh. But what we've seen is that 4G technology is yet to emerge as a dominant form of mobile technology, and its usage remains low, with the technology accounting for only 28% of total mobile connections. Bangladesh also lags regional peers in smartphone adoption. As you can see, it's 41% there, and in a country like India, it's 69%. And this suggests that the lag between the lag between 4G coverage, which is 95%, and the share of 4G connections, which is 28%, suggests that users are facing key barriers preventing them from adopting and using mobile broadband services. And we'll go into more details in the following slides. But to understand the usage gap, there are we looked at four key issues, and the first one is affordability. Major barrier to mobile internet affordability is the cost of internet-enabled handsets. Smartphone ownership is fundamental to expanding internet use, but the cost of the cheapest internet-enabled handset is $29. And for many potential users, even a $29 phone represents a significant one-off cost. Underpinning device cost is consumer sector-specific taxation which affects um, affordability because it raises the cost of owning and using internet-enabled devices. Taxes in Bangladesh include 15% VAT, 25% customs duty, and a 200 Bangladeshi Taka SIM card tax. Now, there are certain business models that can help address the affordability barriers, but restrictions on operators' ability to use, um, for example, fixed SIMs, to offer device subsidies, bundling, or affordable pricing mechanisms further exacerbate the challenge of handset affordability. It's also important to consider the effects of the implementation of the National Equipment Identity Registrar on affordability. The other barrier that we identified is digital knowledge and skills. Digital skills are essential to fully participate, engage, create, and learn online. The lack of digital skills needed to go online is a particular challenge in Bangladesh, with half of respondents to a GSMA intelligence survey citing knowledge and skills as an issue. This means that more needs to be done to assess the local shortfall in digital literacy and skills to equip individuals with the competencies they need to go online. Another key barrier to usage is relevance. 38% um, of users of respondents to the same survey pointed to a lack of usable content. Operators are stepping up to the challenge through the creation of platforms such as Bioscope, Binge, and Toffee, which have expanded the availability of local content and services. But more needs to be done to create an environment for digital businesses to thrive and, and the local digital ecosystem to grow. Finally, we move on to safety and security under the usage gap. 14% of the population in urban areas and 10% of the population in rural areas highlighted concerns around safety and security as a barrier to using mobile internet. These concerns range from threats including harassment, bullying, and disinformation, and women were particularly vulnerable. These concerns can have a significant impact on the adoption of products and services, and in particular, the intention to use the internet. Moving on to the other bit of the gap, which is around coverage. So we looked at three areas, the first being network infrastructure, um, a key supply side barrier is the current licensing regime, which is highly fragmented and complex, and it raises the compliance cost and impacts the end user experience. We can see the effects of the licensing regime manifesting in tower and fiber rollouts in the country, which have faced setbacks. In its current state, the licensing regime affects the ability for operators to explore innovative technologies and deployment models that could help expand coverage. When it comes to spectrum, um, there are challenges to spectrum which affect infrastructure deployment, 
Um, it's expected that the 2021 auction should lessen pressures, but there is still a need for affordable and sufficient amount of spectrum. Finally, we move on to operator-specific taxation. Um, so we, can, we know that high taxes minimize operators' capacity to extend networks. And we've actually listed some of these taxes. So um, you've done like a sector comparison. In terms of minimum turnover tax, operators pay 2%, whereas other sectors, the, the, the range is between 0.5 to 1%. In terms of corporation tax, it's 40% and 45% for publicly and non-publicly traded companies. That's for operators. And then for other sectors, it's 25% and 32.5% respectively. Now we move on to the final section of the report, which is around the recommendations. So we've established that the next decade will be a crucial period for Bangladesh as the government takes steps to achieve Vision 2041, the eight fifth year plan and the SDGs. We know that digital technologies and mobile in particular will play a critical role in tackling the social challenges. So the report concludes with recommendations on how to reduce the barriers to coverage and usage and promote an enabling environment that leverages the full power of mobile internet. So we looked across three key areas. In terms of collaboration, adopting a whole of government and multi-stakeholder approach and collaborating on key action plans to scale um, mobile enabled solutions on the eight fifth year plan priority areas. In terms of closing the coverage gaps, our recommendations are to improve affordability, increase skills and awareness, expand availability of relevant content and services, and improve safety and security. Finally, to close the coverage gap, we recommend a reform to the licensing regime, reduction in sector-specific taxation, the assignment of low price spectrum that is eligible for sharing and secondary trading, and utilizing social obligation funds, in particular, the need to ensure that they are targeted, time-bound, and supported by the regulatory framework, and managed transparently. So that's the end of my presentation, and I will now pass it on to my colleague Rahul, who will be moderating the panel on affordability. Thank you, Leila, for a very quick tour of the report. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I will now be moderating the first panel. So I think, you know, before we go there, I'd like to just say that there were a few things that shaped our panel discussions today. Uh, and you've probably seen some of these in, in the in the report presentation, but I'll just uh, re-emphasize. The 4G usage gap is about 67%, and that far outstrips the coverage gap, which is about 5%. So our panel discussions today focus on the usage gap. Uh, secondly, although Bangladesh beats the UN's affordability target of one for two, which is one gigabyte for 2% uh, of per capita monthly income, Affordability still remains a challenge, and we will discuss this in the first panel. Uh, the lack of digital literacy and skills is a key barrier to 4G uptake. We will discuss this in the second panel. So let me just go over to and invite our panelists uh, for the affordability panel. Uh, firstly, Brigadier, Brigadier General uh, Nassim Parvez, uh, DG of uh, Systems and Services Division of BTRC. Uh, Anju Mangal, Head of APAC for A4AI. Uh, Mahatabuddin Ahmed, Managing Director and CEO for Roby Axiara Limited, as well as President of AMTOB. Uh, Mr. Shahbuddin, Managing Director, Teletalk Bangladesh Limited. And Mohammad Mesbahuddin, Chief Marketing Officer of Fair Group. If we can all please turn on our cameras. Thank you. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the certain rules here. We will, I'll be directing questions to each panelist. They'll have three to four minutes to respond. And uh, we will also try to make sure that we stay within the topic. Uh, I know it's uh, some of these questions of affordability actually touch upon other things like skills, et cetera, but there's an, a following panel which will discuss that in detail. So let's get into the discussion right away. Uh, first of all, I'll turn to uh, our DGSS uh, from BTRC, Brigadier General Nassim Pervez. Uh, I think, sir, the government has released its eighth five year plan, and central to this plan is making available of and of making available affordable and easy to use digital devices to all citizens. In BTRC's view, what role does affordability of 4G services and devices, both services and devices, play in the low levels of uptake that we have seen in our report? Over to you, sir. 
Uh, I think so. You're in mute. Uh, we can't hear you. Okay. Rahul, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, respected minister and respected panelist. So you've already introduced me. So your question uh, relates to affordability uh, from the BTRC's point of view. Uh, BTRC still thinks that uh, affordability of 4G enabled handset is actually the prime obstruction uh, to 4G proliferation in the country. Uh, though the handset price went down a little bit last few years after the you know, start of the assembling of the mobile handsets in Bangladesh, but still we, found, uh, we find that the price is still you know, not uh, less enough uh, for the majority of the people. And thereby we can see that uh, though uh, the 4G coverage uh, presently uh, is uh, more than 95%, especially uh, I know about the Grameen phone. Actually in 26 March, they confirmed that you know, all the BTS they have converted into the 4G handsets. That means 99% population coverage that they have achieved. And also probably the Roby also is doing that good, you know, and all other operators too. But uh, as far as we know, the 4G uh, usage is still, you know, like around 28% uh, uh, or even more than this. So it clearly means that, you know, the affordability problem. As BTRC has seen, you know, the price level that we have seen still the majority of the people, especially in the uh, rural areas, I'm talking about the uh, union or the upujala level, sub-district level, they are, uh, they effort, normally they buy a handset like a Bangladeshi Taka 1000 Taka, which is around, you know, 80, $85. But uh, the 4G handsets that basically is, you know, manufactured in our country, uh, it's around, you know, more than uh, 4000 Taka or around 4000 to 500, 5000. This, these are the not very good quality of 4G handsets, but still, you know, they can afford to, you know, use some kind of 4G uh, services. So this is one of the main issue. And for that, you know, uh, BTRC and uh, the mobile operators and also the mobile manufacturers, we have a lot many things to do. So, uh, and other issues that you are uh, actually in your paper also you have covered, like the knowledge and the skills. Yes, you're very correct. Uh, the digital literacy that we are talking about uh, is that uh, people, many of the most, many, many of the people actually, and they don't know what is 4G. They just know that 4G is probably higher, but they know that if they use 4G, probably they are going to use up you know, more money. So they don't even know that they are going to use more data, but they think that they are going to use more money. So the people are scared so, of you know, spending more money, thereby they don't yeah. actually go to the 4G. And, sure. Uh, thank you. Talking about the. I, I think on skills, yeah, uh, it, we'll just leave it to the second panel. Uh, maybe we can uh, okay. we can go to the next panelist here. Uh, over to Mr. Matabuddin Ahmed, and then followed by uh, Mr. Shahbuddin. Uh, I have the same question. Uh, the report shows there's a disparity, so there's a lag between 4G coverage, uh, which now reaches 95%, as uh, we've just uh, heard, and the share of 4G connections, uh, which accounts for only 28% of mobile connections. In your view, how much of this usage gap can be attributed to issues of affordability of devices and services? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it's a wonderful report, uh, short and crisp. Uh, I think messages are very uh, coming out very clearly. And probably uh, our Honorable Minister, uh, uh, our uh, BTRC uh, friend, colleague, and uh, also DG uh, Nasim Bhai, we pretty much aware of it. Uh, it is not something unknown to us, but I think it has been presented very nicely. Uh, my view is very clear. You are right. Uh, I think the report, uh, the device has been playing a most critical role at this point of time. Uh, if I give you a bit of understanding, if you look at, you know, what are the things which plays role in terms of deciding from consumer perspective? One is data price. Uh, covers part we have discussed. Uh, I think it has covered quite well. Now, next is the price. Price is currently per GB is selling as low as uh, 10 taka per GB, which is around 10 cents or uh, 11 cents. So price has come down to such a low level despite massive taxation has, which has been presented. And I know uh, that if our minister Jabbar Bhai, it had been in his hand, he, he would have reduced all these taxes by himself. But unfortunately, that's not the way that things works in Bangladesh. 
So despite massive taxation, prices come down. So one thing we can clearly say, pricing is not the reason of not adapting 4G. So if we can rule that out uh, for the time being, then what could be the other reasons? Uh, service and capacity, yes, service and capacity is there, at least with new option happening and we have more spectrum in our hand. Hopefully service level will uh, definitely improve, uh, if not for the medium to long term, but at least for the short term. So services is also well taken care of. Now the question comes is, what is the other reasons? And obviously the other reason is uh, uh, device. And what's happening, if I compare even with India, India is on the uh, verge of almost getting rid of 3G. And it was only possible because they could roll out uh, Volti, they could uh, roll out 4G devices very, very aggressively driven by Geo. Now, if I look at the current comparison of Indian market versus Bangladesh market, India is currently, uh, even Geo, Geo has got three range of products at this point of time, ranging from $20 to $40. Uh, you know, very, very sophisticated uh, 4G phones. What is in Bangladesh, a basic quality 4G phone will cost us $50. And it's basic meaning really basic. Now, how can we, uh, you know, drive penetration? And if, you, if I can share some of the data to you, you'll understand. Even today, despite such a massive rollout by uh, almost all the key operators of Bangladesh, and uh, as Nassim Bhai rightly said, even Ruby has a coverage of more than 98% at this point. In fact, all 100% of our sites has got 4G coverage. Now, in that situation, 63% take is still 2G. And if you talk about 3G, it is around 7%, and 4G is around 31%. And out of that, even if you locally manufactured one, if you look at, only 18% is 4G, and still it is 2G dominated. So I think there is no one is under pressure other than the operators to drive 4G devices. Device manufacturers is not under pressure. Our regulators is not under pressure, though they have a positive intention. I'm sorry to say that. And of course, duty is also plays a role. It's, I don't think duty is, uh, and I'm sure Mizba is going to cover when he talks about it. So all these are the primary reasons for uh, doing that. But finally, I would say is while I'm saying all these uh, barriers, but I must say it is still uh, we can resolve this problem if all these departments and divisions work together. When I say that, I know our honorable minister understand that and he's ready to solve it. But he needs support from NBR. He needs support from other ministries, finance ministry and others to make it happen. So I think we have this integrated effort to overcome this problem. Thank you. I, I think we, we completely agree that a whole of government approach is required to, to solve some of the you know, key problems here. I'll, I'll turn over to Mr. Shahbuddin and ask for your view, sir, on, on the same question. Thank you, Rahul. Respected Chief Guest, Honorable Minister, Mr. Mr. Job Barsal, Honorable uh, all the participants uh, in this uh, roundtable, First of all, we want to see uh, in the Bangladesh government side has to be taken various steps to digitize the community with inclusion, with include the setting of the union digital center level. We know we have the connectivity of union, uh, uh, union level and we have the um, availability of all the rural region 4G connectivity, especially for a mobile operator. But the problem is the same, the uh, mobile set and at the same time the mobile de uh, digital device, the uh, uh, set and digital device, the price is, uh, price is a little bit higher compared to the, our affordability. You know, the, in the rural area, they're uh, habituated to use the feature phone and this price is already uh, our DG spectrum will mention here. The price is habituated and price is a key factor. And another is that, uh, another is problem is uh, you know uh, the, we, we have to uh, uh, encourage our uh, you, uh, utilizations of the 4G in in, in the rural area level, especially in uh, rural area level. So that needs to be uh, develop uh, skill uh, our uh, skill our uh, institution level. So. Uh, we need uh, uh, our help from the government side uh, on the institutional level to uh, the advantage of this 4G and uses of the 4G and on how this 4G can uh, impact our social socioeconomic development. And another issue, I think, so uh, like other country, we can uh, use the, uh, the mobile set lock with the SIM. 
this is another uh, we can we can use the uh, and, and uh, many local manufacturer they can come to the uh, uh, operator to lock their seam and then it, that's uh, that can be uh, used and that can be a uh, create some uh, expansions of the uses of the 4g and capping for the digital literacy for general citizens of the bangladesh may be the strengthening so that to find out more utility for using smartphone and you know at the same time more digital content and useful service in bangladesh need to be created and so uh, we have uh, here uh, we should be uh, considered that uh, uh, content should be the local language you know uh, yeah. some area yeah, I think, uh, I think, yeah. so i think the considering I think consisting point, uh, we'll so we'll be discuss more deeply in, in okay. the panel so we can leave the literacy portion aside for now Okay. Uh, so okay. the second panel can have a full discussion on that. But I will, okay. I will let me turn now to Anju Mangal, uh, who is uh, from the Alliance for Affordable Internet. And the organization A4AI works to drive down the cost of internet access in low and middle income countries. So Anju, in your views, uh, what has your research shown about handset affordability and its role in internet adoption and use? Um, thank you, Rahul. Um, His, His Excellency, Honorable Minister Jabbar, Anir Bhai, BTRC colleagues, GSMA, and ITU, and my fellow speakers and distinguished guests. It's nice to see familiar faces. Thank you so much for inviting me to this um, great event. So most of us know that the biggest barrier to internet access today is cost and price, which continues to come as a major barrier. In 2020, we launched a report on reducing cost of mobile devices, handsets to reach universal access. And our research um, covered 70 low and middle income countries, including Bangladesh. And the report provided a survey of mobile handset costs. So looking not only at the retail price of device, but the affordability, the so price in relation to income. So in Bangladesh, we collected the cheapest available online price for a smartphone from a major mobile um, network operator. We also uh, benchmarked the prices for feature phones, which while not as powerful as smartphones, but can provide some level of internet connectivity at um, lower cost than smartphones. So our survey focused on smartphones because um, these are the devices mostly people use and uh, connect to the internet. And a lot of this is in line with our meaningful connectivity targets. So making sure that everyone has regular internet use, um, 4G speed, a good affordable uh, data plan and uh, affordable devices such as smartphones. So our methodology is, uh, was based on devices on offer on the websites of mobile network operators, GSMA and ITU price basket methodology, and but reflects the important role that operators play in creating trust in the device market. People are more likely to trust the quality of a device being sold by an operator with a famous brand name. And we found that, of course, price is influenced by the text environment, uh, many mobile devices, most uh, manufactured abroad, imported, and are text that gets passed on to customers in the retail price of device. And there were several other um, factors. The retail price that a user can expect to pay for a new smartphone, so for component costs to taxation, and to also market preferences. And I just wanted to um, add one more thing. High smartphone or handset cost can also impact women. So we looked at uh, women with disabilities, also with women, because the assistive technologies are so expensive. So our disability colleagues and friends rely on smartphones to carry out their online activities. So we also need to consider them. And as um, shared by some of these um, women participants in our focus group discussions in Bangladesh, we, we realized that cultural norms can discourage women and girls using mobile devices for a number of reasons. Um, so to, to have that push, uh, having more women into informal device sharing and gifting was, um, was very common in Bangladesh rather than purchasing um, devices themselves. And uh, generally, as uh, mentioned in your report, uh, the cheaper smartphone on offer in Bangladesh is around um, 29 to 33, uh, $33 mm -hmm. USD which is roughly 23% of average monthly income. So yes, affordability is a huge concern, um, but we Thank need you. to work together and have good policies. Thank you, Anju. Uh, some interesting points there, but you know, now we've heard from uh, four speakers who are saying that 
access to affordable devices is is a problem. And now I'll bring the Fair Group in. They obviously uh, are manufacturing handsets, and we'd like to hear from you. Uh, you know, on on your point of view about affordability, and you know, what are the most important factors uh, that influence the price of a smartphone, and what do you see as the the inflection point uh, from your perspective, where 4G smart, uh, smartphones will become mass market. Uh, thank you, uh, respected uh, minister. Your voice is a bit low, sir. Uh, if you can. Uh, yeah, yeah, can you, you hear me now? Yeah, okay, okay. So, respected uh, minister of uh, post and telecommunications, the officer, and uh, the panelists, my senior brothers uh, from um, Roby and uh, and GSMR, thank you for inviting me. I actually, uh, I just want to clarify a few things. Uh, the duty which has been said at 15% and 25% is for imported product. Um, and smartphone today, uh, if you have an understanding about the market, the 85% of the smartphones which are being sold to Bangladesh are locally manufactured. And these are duty as low as 1% uh, to about average of 13%. So that means uh, our duty and taxation is not a big barrier today uh, to bring the product into the market, number one. Uh, number two is uh, the device itself, the price. Uh, definitely, uh, there is a uh, thousand taka, which is roughly about uh, about $10 to $12 product versus a $30, $35 or $40 product. Definitely, there is an affordable crisis for consumers to buy a smartphone. Um, so if you look into all the developing countries or all the developed countries, which has got a very high uh, penetration of uh, data enabled devices, is basically bought through plans, so which is basically through an operator bundle. Uh, so I, I would emphasize that, you know, a consumer who are buying a phone at 1000 taka or $10 or something like that will definitely would love to get a $10 product for a smartphone. So how we can take it to them, that's a question mark. Uh, so we, we talked about SIM lock, device locks, and you know uh, the EMI process, or there are also um, evidence in, in this part of the world uh, where we are giving a cash EMI to the consumers to get a device and a loan or installment process. So that has to be there. Even if you look into US, um, uh, where 100% or 95% is uh, data enabled devices. They're also buying in plans. So I think that's the very important part. Our second most important part is the content because the people who are using. Sorry. Uh, I, yeah. I, I will, I will interrupt there because, you know, the content panel is following. Let's, okay. uh, let's, yeah, uh, skills, okay. et cetera. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that to the second panel. But, uh, okay. in terms so, of, in terms of that inflection point, where, where do you feel like you know, is it ten dollars really? I mean, that a smartphone available for ten dollars—that's that's a very difficult, very uh, you know, threshold to reach, perhaps. But do you think it's fifteen, twenty? Where, where do you think it will actually excite the mass market? See, uh, uh, today, if I also analyze the the feature phone sales uh, out of uh, like twenty-three million feature phones sold last year, uh, there is a major chunk which is a feature phone sold at a price of twenty dollars. So, like the Nokia feature phone, mm. and the Samsung feature phone, are still selling in the market. So, there is a, a people who has got a problem of not understanding the proper things, which I'm not talking about. Uh, so, if you look into uh, bringing them on board, probably there is some other way. But if you want to take all the pyramid on the lower level, then you have to bring it down to a level of that's about twenty dollars, fifteen to twenty dollars yeah. a data enabled phone. The another thing I just want to highlight is these people are using uh, a mobile phone for voice call. So they, they, they may not uh, love to use uh, a data enabled contents or any other thing. They want to do a voice. So if we can bring a uh, whole key or that kind of thing, which you has done yeah. in India, otherwise already told, I think then people will come and say, okay, a smartphone I can use Volti at a much more cheaper price than a feature phone, they might come up, come back. So that's very important. Okay. So I think if you, if you say there's an infect point, it's very difficult to say today. But if I can bring in an EMI kind of thing at $10 every yeah. 
that's about uh, five dollars every month or three dollars every month for a package. I think it will. Okay, I I will now move on. Uh, thank you for those. Uh, I think they're important remarks because I know that you know everybody feels we we that it's the device side, but we really value your your viewpoints here. So I will go back now uh, to Anju. Um, I think uh, with Anju, so a key part of your work in Bangladesh is, in, you know, it involves contributing towards government policy to bring affordable internet access to the citizens. Now, in terms of handset affordability, 4G handset affordability, what policy and regulatory reform do you see need for? Um, so, at this to let everyone know that we are going to be um, revising the 2009 National Broadband Policy. It has already achieved its short-term and mid-term and long-term goals, but much work still remains to reach the 2030 and 2040 um, goals as well. Um, so, one of the things that we would like to um, mention, which will be articulated in the new broadband policy, would be and it's already mentioned in, to some extent is reducing taxes on low cost devices. But one of the things that we would like to reiterate and would like to say is that having special reduced taxes for women in particular, particular also women in, with disabilities, so that they are encouraged to buy a smartphone and coming up with digital programs to empower women and girls. That's one of the things that we are planning to um, to um, uh, mention. The other one is, um, the other two that I would like to also say is that social obligation fund, which I think has already been mentioned by my colleagues, to make telecommunication services available is key. So addressing the device affordability barrier, which uh, which can include subsidy programs for, for those least able to buy devices would be um, great. And also um, coming up with some innovative innovative financing models to reduce the capital people need up front to purchase a device. So these are some of the things that we are planning to do into and, and also articulate in national broadband policy. I'm just going to leave it at that. That's good. Thank you. I think uh, with the SOF, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, an alternate approach, <laughs> which we won't debate here. But uh, really, you know, what, what is the purpose of the SOF and why is it? Why is it actually connected if uh, if it's not for coverage? So anyway, let's let's uh, I will move on back again to Mesbah Bhai. Uh, you know, with uh, with the government having done so much for manufacturing, what else can it do? Uh, you know, what el what other support can policymakers provide for 4G smartphone manufacturing to further drive down prices? And this could also, you know, it could also uh, address some of the most expensive components that uh, that you have to you have to maybe buy from somewhere else. Uh, basically, I believe the government has given us uh, enough for the manufacturing part. One thing I would like to through this meeting request, uh, uh, honourable minister, also that uh, what we can come up with is an exchange offer for the feature phones to smartphone kind of thing. Uh, that might trigger uh, a lot of coverage uh, issues. So people come back with a feature phone and getting a smartphone uh, with, uh, let's start, uh, with certain discounts. Uh, we, we ran a uh, certain program like that. But the SIM locks and device lock and uh, taking uh, to the consumers um, at, at a most affordable cash layout, the initial cash payment, uh, has to be there, and uh, that has to be supported through a system where people cannot do fraud and stick on it. Kind of. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will now turn back to our uh, operator CEOs. So first, uh, Mr. Shahbuddin, and then followed by Mr. Mahatabuddin Ahmed. Uh, you, you've seen, I think you know, a lot has already been mentioned here in terms of financing, in terms of SIM lock, device lock, uh, other other examples, perhaps the geophone has come up. What, what what sort of practices you think can be replicated in Bangladesh that may have been you know adopted in other countries? And uh, this is specifically for handset affordability, of course. Uh, and do you feel that there are any policy barriers to the implementation of these practices that uh, perhaps we can address? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> you have already. Uh, uh, had from the um, from Mesbahuddin from Fair Group, he told us already uh, how to uh, adapt the smartphone to the in in, in our uh, 
rural area level exclusively, exclusively and much level uh, level so in that case uh, uh, you have to uh, suggest uh, to, to lock one of the ways to, to lock the seam another ways to keep the sub install when payment to easy payment and, and another way, uh, thing is in fact uh, you know the main problem in our uh, the thing is though those who are using the uh, feature phone very difficult to uh, and, and, uh, very difficult to motivate to use that another mobile phone uh, especially for the uh, that advanced phone so this will be uh, and now we have to need to, uh, to first of all to realize that the, the fear um, use of this uh, uh, smartphone and how they can we contribute and how that can their life will be easy and can contribute the economic and the, the national side so first of all i think so um, you should uh, from the mobile manufacturer uh, they should be uh, tagged with the operator especially for the uh, how to sell your uh, to mobile phone and using from a subscriber point of view that can be how you know the if you, uh, we, we can give a uh, we can give the offer uh, if they come here and then can we use uh, use our subscriber in, in terms of easy payment like uh, per, uh, per month or uh, 200 or 500 uh, taka and you are using the uh, our uh, talk time and said so, like size so this long term long term installation payment we can uh, we can help uh, we can help them especially and uh, another issue is uh, the um, affordability we have already discussed and and safety and security and then things also very much uh, in the uh, year is very much uh, essential you know uh, they are not uh, habituated to use and uh, they are not also interested so first of all to try to uh, our manufacturer side uh, and also our our um, uh, apologies sir uh, i think operator uh, side to do an understanding yeah. the idea okay I'll have to move on because I think, again, safety and security, perhaps we will be coming to in the second <coughs> panel, at least briefly. But uh, let me hand over to Mr. Matapuddin Ahmed uh, for his views. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Raul. Uh, I think uh, some bit already uh, Shabuddin Bhai has covered, but uh, I'll go very uh, straight. First of all, the, it should be open up. Uh, what I mean by opening up, it is the operators or MNOs should be allowed to import or directly procure from uh, local vendors. Uh, otherwise, and we should be uh, experimenting with local vendors about the low cost devices. So, if this is not open up to MNOs, we would not be able to, uh, you know, uh, provide these kind of low cost devices to the people as GOD. You know, GOD did not have any restriction as to from what to source and where not to source. So, I think these kind of uh, restrictions only, uh, you know, put the market behind, put the people behind. So I think that first condition is that. Second thing from regulatory perspective, what I would expect uh, is they should ensure that all the local productions happens and all the input happens. The easy one, 3G, no 3G devices should be brought in into the country or manufactured into the country. 3G is a dead technology. So any devices that come, it has to be 4G with Volti uh, enabled. So these two I would expect from regulatory perspective. And from uh, a mono perspective, if we talk about like already Ruby is doing a lot of bundle uh, with uh, the uh, device manufacturers, local device manufacturers, even uh, fair group. We have been doing it for many years, but that is for upper group or upper uh, segment. But if you look at the lower, lower segment, like uh, uh, what uh, uh, we have been hearing, Ruby introduced a Joita as a product for device financing for women. And uh, that has been quite successful. But of course, it has not reached to the scale that we expected it to be. We also have a handset financing facility using alternative credit scoring that we started in 2020. It is expanding. So all this new new stuff that we have been trying to do, uh, and uh, but as you know, if you don't get regulatory level and government level support, the kind of impact that you want to create, we may not be able to create that kind of impact. Then we also, uh, like Emona offers devices as bundled mobile services that take off the financial burden to buy new technology compatible phone. So. Carrier lock-in, already we have talked about, we have to ensure that. Uh, then uh, if, uh, like Geo, if Emino can offer the branded devices, that would be super. So I think from our neighboring countries, we have a lot to learn. Even if we replicate some of these, 
uh, we should be able to uh, solve that problem. And last but not the least, if our regulators wants and uh, our honorable minister give the clear direction to the team, I think uh, it's not a big problem because if we can take one uh, number, when Geo started in 2016, the 4G devices penetration was 9%. And today it has crossed 67%. So even if we replicate the model of India with bit of customization considering the local context, I'm sure we can do also wonder. Uh, so I'm quite hopeful still, subject to we get that uh, regulatory support from uh, uh, with others. And of course, MNO has to play their own, own role. Over to you, Raul. Oh, we, we can't hear you, Rahul. Apologies for that. Sorry. Uh, so thank you for that, Matabai. Uh, I'll turn over now to BTRC. So Brigadier General Nassim Pervez, uh, you've been hearing so many uh, you know, requests uh, from the MNOs. Uh, I think uh, Mesbah Bhai uh, said that manufacturing is, is going well. Uh, perhaps there are other options to, for financing. Uh, Anju as well has asked about, uh, you know, made some recommendations around affordability. What, what do you think the BTRC can do uh, to address this issue of affordability? And uh, I will I will actually, because we're running short of time, I will also merge this into the next question as to what are the next steps that we should be taking over the next 12 months. Uh, so first over to, uh, first over to DGSS. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Rahul. I think BTRC can do a lot. Uh, BTRC has done also a lot. Like the mobile manufacturing yes. you're talking about, basically this is a BTRC to uh, the initiative. The NER that is coming, this is also BTRC is doing. And BTRC is ready to take any good measures that has been actually asked by the mobile operators and also uh, by uh, the mobile manufacturers. I think just one, one thing I want to say that we do not still yet have you know, the uh, data tariff. The operators can actually give data at even zero cost and even now, 16% of their data are sold at you know, the zero cost. Now they can always do bundle, you know, there's something called the co-branding, which is actually allowed from the BTRC. Always it is in consultation with a mobile operator and also the manufacturer. The operators, uh, the co-branding is that they cannot really buy, but this other way they really buy it. There's a common package where both the party together offer to the people. Now, if they offer uh, a handset, like they can, okay, fine, uh, you can, uh, you just buy a handset of uh, like smartphone with $10, which is basically costing around $40. And if he uses the data of that particular operator, that is how he can make the rest of the payment. So he is paying only $10, uh, but getting a handset of $40, but he is using the data like of $30 data, and thereby he can get, you know, comp you know he can really work out. Thereby, the operators also will create a habit to the users. Okay, they start using the data, they are getting used to it, and later on, he's going to use the handset, you know? So thereby, people got to invest in the handset. It's jointly, probably by the manufacturer also, also by the mobile operators. So they can come out on this kind of, you know, the uh, initiative, and BTRC will definitely work out. And uh, one point about, uh, Mahathab has said that about the 3G handset, uh, BTRC should stop. In fact, the statistics also says that the 3G handsets is like only four to five percent handsets are 3G uh, in overall. So I don't think that uh, it's uh, any any particular user is asking for the 3G handsets. So the manufacturers they can stop uh, manufacturing the 3G handsets if they want a regularity, actually uh, any guidelines. So they can always propose, and I'm sure uh, BTS will be able to you know, give them that kind of you know the instructions. This is actually in short that uh, specifically I want to say, uh, BTRC will help in future also, let them come with proposals and we'll do it, inshallah. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that supportive message. Sir. Uh, I think I've got my two minute warning. So I will just turn to the other panelists uh, on next steps. What, what do you think the next steps are? So, you know, uh, whoever wants to go first, Anju or uh, uh, Mesba Bhai or Mata Bhai, Shabuddin Bhai. Uh, okay, let, let, let me go first. Uh, okay, sorry, go ahead, Anju. No, no, please go ahead, sir. It's okay. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So, so I think first one that I said is uh, we have to reduce uh, uh, like 51% of the almost 50% of the devices are manufactured locally and 50% are imported. So 
we have to bring some uh, uh, balance in the tariff uh, or duties. If you don't do that, I don't think we can achieve our goal. Second point is uh, there has to, as I said, uh, Nasimba said, the guideline for uh, in this case, 2G and 3G, uh, what I'm saying, custom duty for or VAT for 2G, 3G should be higher and 4G should be significantly lower. So that could also bring, encourage users and manufacturers to produce more of a 4G. So we need to incentivize all the stakeholders involved in this device to do that. And uh, uh, one more point I would like to highlight is that local content, yes, our Honorable Minister is very much into it. Already we have achieved quite a bit. So local content, we have to do a bit more so that uh, people are like to you because 38% are uh, showing that as a barrier. So I think our, uh, we have a MNO has alignment with the government on that, uh, and I think we can achieve achieve that. So these are the few points from our side. Uh, as I said, I'm quite hopeful if you work together to achieve that kind of milestone, what we're looking for. Yes, over to you, Anju. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I acknowledge and thank the government of Bangladesh, um, the minister um, and A2I policy lead, uh, Anir, because he is our partner and, and his team and also BTRS, BTRC. Dot. They have all reiterated many times in high level meetings their commitment of Bangladesh's vision in ensuring high speed Internet connectivity. But one thing that I like is that they are wanting to provide this to all schools by 2030. And I would like to focus on this to some extent because in the next 12 months, can these cheap handsets and affordable devices with 4G connection be available for the students so that they can go online without any issues to access any resources? And how can um, policymakers monitor it carefully to make sure that changes in the tax regime um, translate into lower prices, particularly for these students and women and also persons with disability. And I always want to reiterate, that I need to think about, we need to think about our stakeholders. And we want to mention that for us, it's important to have a national broadband policy and to be effective and successful. So it requires support from all the key stakeholders that are here and also the buy-in from, um, um, from our people and from the people that we are doing all this work for with the aim to allow governments to foster collaboration and partnership and also to get um, development organizations to fill in some of these gaps that are not able to uh, be achieved by um, um, Bangladesh to some extent. So I'm just going to leave it at that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Any Rahul, any other Rahul, final comment? Yes, Rahul. Yeah. Yes. Only one point I want to add, Rahul. Yes. Uh, I think the GSMA. Yeah. If you allow me. Yeah. Just only one point. Please go ahead, Rahul. Okay. The point is that uh, the GSMA also can support our mobile manufacturers. Like they buy the tech number with actually high cost. So since you know the uh, more than 50% handsets are being manufactured or assembled in Bangladesh. So at least for next couple of years, the GSMA, if they reduce the tech price in these countries uh, to a good amount, you know, thereby also the price of the handsets, the manufacturers assemblers can reduce. That's what, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I think uh, the tech cost, I mean, since it's a direct solution, I'll just respond very quickly, but my understanding is that the the cost per model is really, really low, actually, if you, uh, you know, so it get, goes down to pennies, literally. So I, I don't think it'll be significant, but we can certainly, you know, take this offline and uh, and see if there's, uh, if I haven't fully understood your comment. Uh, so, uh, okay, I, I think we're now, uh, sorry, Mesohai, go ahead. Okay. Yes. Um, we, we've been talking about the taxation issue. I think taxation. Sorry, can you please raise your uh, microphone up again? Yeah, so uh, we, we've been talking about taxation. I don't think taxation is an issue. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, uh, because 85% of the smartphone are being produced in Bangladesh, so uh, no, there's not much of import happening today. So that's number one. Number two is manufacturing tax is taking be low. Uh, we can see in further lower down of taxes, but that will not significantly uh, change the affordability part. Uh, I think the most important part is the first cash layout, which is the consumers are having, like whether it's women, whether it's all those uh, low income group, they have to buy our devices cheaper than a feature phone today. So that's how it will grow. 
and uh, yeah. definitely i don't want to talk about content so that's the another thing yes thank you all right so i think i think you know uh, that was a an invigorating discussion i uh, hope that we've touched upon most of the angles on affordability especially of devices uh we i, I think we there are points of agreement and points of disagreement which is which is great because you know that's how we would like a panel to emerge and because there are points of agreement and disagreement we hope that we can uh, find ways to work together and you know have further conversations uh, to come to a common understanding so with that i'm going to leave this panel and i'm going to invite uh, uh, my uh, the head of region julian gorman but before that uh, i will just thank all the panelists uh, for participating in this and sharing your views uh, very openly thank you very much uh, julian over to you uh, thank you very much rahul i trust you can hear me now um honorable minister mustafa jaba minister of Post telecommunication it fellow speakers and panelists and distinguished guests um thank you for allowing me to moderate this panel um and with my esteemed panelists who i'll introduce shortly uh, to discuss the challenge of building digital skills and knowledge usage of mobile services because for me this is a personal uh, passion it's a challenge close to my heart it has challenged me, challenged me even haunted me i suppose since the first days of sms mobile money services i was involved in in the early 2000s and it's continued throughout my career at the end of the day for me when you build the technology create the coverage make the services available and, and make the devices affordable as been discussed in that last panel the scale and complexity of digital skills challenge is something that's really hard to comprehend without seeing it firsthand, I think. Um, getting smartphones in people's hands has a significant impact on your chance of success, I think, as it reduces the complexity of digital skills. But skills must be learned, and that requires personal will and interest and, and awareness uh, of the individual. And of course, digital skills are an essential ingredient in that medley, really, of issues that need to work in harmony together to grow digital inclusion. And it is often rare to find digital skills as the only barrier to digital inclusion. And that's been highlighted in the report. But it can be a, an issue that's extremely handicapping and even embarrassing obstacle that often disproportionately impacts uh, the disadvantaged, um, you know, whether it's women or through cultural things or people who are, you know, don't have all the same advantages in society. And so therefore understanding the complexity requires real knowledge and experience from those who have tried, and that's where today I'm joined by my panelists who are going to share their thoughts on the challenge in front of us. Who I know all have deep experience um, and their own and their own learnings over time. So during the panel, if you have any questions, uh, again, just write them in the Q and A, and we'll, if we've got time, we'll pass them on to the panelists. And for the panelists, I remind you we're on a bit of a tight schedule, actually to keep your answers to four minutes or less. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce uh, Anir Chowdhury, policy advisor for Aspire to Innovate. Um, Atsuko Akudo, um, Regional Director, Asia and Pacific uh, for ITU. Uh, Jens Becker, Acting CEO of Grameen Phone. And Taimur Rahman, Chief Corporate and Regulatory Affairs Officer from Bangalink Digital Communications. First, maybe to set the scene um, on what is the role of knowledge and skills in uh, mobile internet adoption, Atsuko, if the ITU has been involved in work that increases digital inclusion globally, and this includes reducing the skills gap. And it will be interesting for you to start the panel by setting the scene. And where you see digital skills are important to digital inclusion, and what would you say the level of digital skills is an issue for digital development in the region generally? Thank you. Um, thank you, Julian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Jawa, uh, and his delegates, I'm very honored to be here today and to talk about digital skills in the context of digital inclusion. As we can all imagine, digital skills is really the key to uh, fulfill the true um, uh, goal of digital inclusion. So let me just rephrase it. What does it mean if there is no digital skills? Um, and uh, we have to expand the digital inclusion. So what would they do without digital skills? I think this is an essential question, not only in the context of Bangladesh, but in the region as well as globally. Uh, in this context, as you know, ITU has a, a very comprehensive program of uh, digital inclusion, which covers different groups in society, such as girls, in IC, uh, girls and young women, uh, youth, older people, and uh, people with disabilities. But we believe that 
this digital skills have to be put in the context of digital services because digital skills is uh, uh, becomes an important topic when uh, there is a clear um, objective of what is it that these digitally included people can do and what is required to achieve the goals that they have. So in this context, uh, the previous uh, speakers also mentioned about the importance of uh, uh, digital services and uh, the socioeconomic uh, impact and benefits of uh, um, having uh, mobile access. Now, I would like to give uh, an example and how we see it here in uh, ITU, uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Um, I would like to uh, give an example of uh, uh, school connectivity. In addition to the, the, the group-specific uh, skills development, we also look at a sector-specific skills development in the context of digital inclusion. And as you may know, ITU is working with UNICEF to connect the unconnected schools in Asia and the Pacific and globally. And we have been assisting Thailand, Bhutan and Pakistan to accelerate the, uh, the initiative because of the, the COVID-19 and the negative impact we have ob uh, observed uh, during the uh, school closures. So the skills came in this context when we connect the, the schools or unconnected schools in rural areas and remote areas in these countries. Uh, the next question uh, became, what do they do when they are connected and the, the, the equipment were purchased? And that's the context when we talk about digital skills and we uh, then very specifically target at teachers training and the digital skills and the digital literacy of the student themselves and the services that the community members can acquire through the connection that is uh, uh, established. So I believe, uh, Julian, that to answer your question on the needed digital skills in the context of digital inclusion, I believe that we can look at um, group-wise uh, approach. The girls and women may need a specific way and approach to use the mobile services and devices, and so do the uh, people with disabilities. And at the same time, perhaps we can look at uh, the sector-specific approach, schools, hospitals, and agriculture, and there, we believe that the specific skills development uh, could be discussed and further accelerated uh, to achieve the true goal of uh, digital inclusion. So back to you, Julian. Thanks, Jessica. I think there are great points there. Um, the, uh, certainly my experience is the viral effect of, of um, specific training and how it can spread through a family or through the workplace by, uh, or through an education facility by teaching one who passes on. But um, now, maybe if I ex uh, pass it over then to Jens and followed by Tamir, I suppose Atsuko just spoke about the significant digital skills, increasing internet usage, and the diversity of approaches. Um, so when you break it down to Bangladesh, how much of a role do you think a lack of skills and literacy is playing in the low levels of 4G usage we're seeing in Bangladesh? So Jens? Yeah. And yes, I hope I'm uh, audible. On it. Yep. First of all, thank you for, for having me here, Honorable Minister, also DG Nazim and all the respected panelists. Very happy to be here. So coming, coming to your question, I indeed believe that uh, addressing the skill sets and lit literacy that we've seen from the, from the report will play a significant role in reducing the usage gap that we've seen against the 4G coverage, right? This is what the report refers to. And, and this can be seen, in my opinion, from a, a couple of angles into it. When we witnessed the uh, uptake of uh, the digital uptake during the pandemic right now, this was not only an uptake of uh, data usage from the end user. What we've witnessed is that this is a, a totally higher digitalization of the economy worldwide and everywhere. And this certainly will continue, right, also after. And uh, skills, especially the digital skills that we see are becoming even more pivotal, I would say, right now and entering into a, in a post-pandemic area. 
that we have. So especially for the for the use segment and for creation of economic opportunities, I think we have to we have the strong need to enable all the use, all the the not so skilled, uh, digitally skilled people to participate in this uh, tremendously increasing digital journey of the economy. And if you put it even now coming to 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 Bangladesh and putting it even in a in a bit more midterm, long term view, then then seeing again you have these millions of young people waiting for opportunities to be created. But they are a potential in in themselves, right? Because it's a huge mass. And if you if you look into the power it can have in transforming Bangladesh into a very resilient knowledge based economy, right? We're attracting high investments uh, into the country and be a renowned place for uh, for a very high skilled and right skilled uh, population. Then it pays very much also in the vision of of the government in the vision of 2041 of a high income country and therefore i believe really it's mandatory uh, that we that we have to focus on upskilling uh, all the people and right skilling them for the digital world so in a nutshell i would say enhancing those those skills will pay definitely to close the the, the usage gap but also will will pay very much into uh, uh, unleashing the potential of, of Bangladesh and uh, supporting the vision of the government. Fantastic. I mean, thanks for those comments, Jens. I think um, maybe hand it over to Tamu now. I mean, from another operator's perspective, um, how are you seeing um, the challenge in, in solving those, those skill and literacy levels to, to really get into 4G adoption? Uh, thanks. Um, again, uh, the Honorable Minister, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Minister Nassim, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's an honor to me, for me to be here. I think uh, if, if I take another angle, um, you know, knowledge and skill barriers to the adoption of technology you know, by the Bangladeshi people is of course uh, an issue. But what we have seen over the years, we do grab technology very fast if it's really needed for us. And we really adopt fast. I think that, that we have, you know, if we see, for example, in 1998, you know, a little more than 20 years back, the teledensity was less than 1%. In 2020, it has crossed 100%. So you see that, you know, there's a necessity of phones, there's a necessity of communication, we adopt. I think that's something that we have been able to show as, a, as, as, as people of Bangladesh. I think that's something that we see that adoption, yes, it's difficult, but when it's needed, we go for it. Um, again, through this, what we have also seen, for example, the 3G, it came out only a six, maybe a six years back, but already we are seeing this uh, sunset and people are adopting to 4G, although it's pretty less few now, but we are actually going there. I think that's something that we see that, Adoption, when it's there, I think we, we really do it fast. I think another thing what we have also seen, you know, being part of the telecommunication in the industry in Bangladesh, I think we should be, you know, we are pretty proud of the changes that we have made over the years. Uh, I think, for example, the farmers who had really huge difficulty to sell their products in the cities, now it's no more there. The, the middleman is gone. I think that really has improved the overall GDP of the country. Uh, you know, for example, the uh, natural disasters, which we still have, but the um, loss of lives is really negligible now. Again, how we have part and how the people have also adopted in getting the technology to help themselves. I think that's something that uh, you know we we are really seeing that you know adoption does happen if you if, if it's necessary for the people. Again, the technology, the mobile technology has also created thousands of jobs in Bangladesh. I think that's again something that again people uh, need that and they are using it. So that's something that uh, we really see that it's happening and we we do adapt fast. Um, if I if I see that you know um, uh, how that has happened, I, I think we should really acknowledge again the minister had been a big part that from 2028 20, to, to, to 2008 the government took this uh, initiative of digital Bangladesh. Nobody really knew what that was, right? But that's the platform that where we are right now and really where we have been, uh, what we have been able to achieve. This this last year of 2020, this pandemic year, I think. Nobody would have imagined in Bangladesh that we, our children are doing classes through online or our uh, doctors are actually giving advices online without seeing the uh, patients. This, this is unbelievable. Like it could have only happened to developed countries. I think that's something that we see that, you know, let the people uh, need something, they'll do it. I think that's something that we, we see the Bangladeshi people. They really are, are, are very fast adaptive. I think that's something that we should be proud. Uh, from my side, I think, uh, you know, 
for faster adoption of the technology. Uh, I feel that uh, the main issue from us on Bangladesh, not only Bangladesh, I think some South Asian countries too, uh, we see that the relevant contents, I think that's very important for us. Like, do we have the relevant contents? Uh, you know, the language is an issue. I think we should be having more Bangla-based uh, applications. Uh, the minister is very, very active on this, and we are also working with the government in how to make that happen. I think Bangla-based uh, applications more friendly. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, what I, I would also agree to our previous speaker that uh, inclusion of women for digital literacy. That's more than 50%, I think, in Bangladesh of our population. They have to be included. Otherwise, you know, we'll be stuck uh, somewhere and we will not grow. And basically, our women are actually our teachers to the students, uh, to the children. I think if they are not learned, the next generation will also fall behind. I think that's something we really need to see how we can involve more women for digital literacy. Uh, we should be creating more applications that are actually more friendly towards the uh, next generation and our children. Uh, of course, safety is another concern of the people, whether the uh, applications that they have, are they safe? I think that's something that we need to educate our subscribers together along with the government. Uh, I think these are these are the things uh, that we have to work together, both the private and the public sector. Um, you know, from Bangladesh side, what we had done, um, I think we are just, just a few things. Uh, basically, we had partnered with actually GSMA in 2019 to educate uh, our subscribers, uh, how to use a phone, how to use internet over the phone. Uh, and that that's like more than 120,000 of our subscribers got this activity, um, you know, through the help of GSME. We really are help, um, grateful to GSME for this. We also partnered with uh, Facebook uh, to uh, for digital literacy of women working in garments, uh, you know, how again, how to use internet. So that's something that what we have done. So these are some of the activities what we have tried to do uh, from our side, you know, just to lift up the Literacy. We are also working on some entertainment uh, applications, mainly in Toffee, where we have a lot of Bangla-based contents. So um, these are some things that we are trying to do to help uh, the society. Um, and again, we have to work together with the government and us you know, to uh, make uh, to drive uh, this uh, digital literacy together. So Thanks very much, Tamir. I think you've uh, traversed a good, good uh, distance of ground there, and maybe got into some of our future questions. Um, and, but maybe, and that's where maybe I think I'd like to take the panel now where, around the challenges and solutions to increasing those digital knowledge skills. And obviously, having the uh, good, good quality apps um, and good user experience is important. But now, if I, I pass to Ania, you know, the eighth uh, five year plan it specifically addresses and recognizes the importance of um, the change in demands for digital skills. And it's extremely important that individuals are self sufficient um, as they use the internet. And this requires, you know, that we can measure digital skills, develop strategies and policies that work for users, life goals, and you know, their individual needs. So, what are you seeing the driving forces are behind the skills level we see in the country, and and how is the government working to create digital interventions that equip individuals, really working with individuals and in the knowledge instances? What what are you seeing from your point of view? Thank you, Julian. Honourable Minister, colleagues from Bangladesh and from other countries. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, Leila uh, Rahul uh, for the presentation. Excellent report that covered a whole range of issues, starting from coverage gaps, cost of devices, infrastructure, taxation, skills that we are discussing now. Um, <clears throat> and the report actually identifies a number of great initiatives. Uh, Taimur Bhai just talked about Bangla Links. Uh, uh, effort to educate uh, people about internet usage uh, along with Facebook and other partners, uh, both pri public and private. So I think there is a lot of great initiatives about skills development, how internet could be used. <clears throat> so let me talk about maybe three things. The first is awareness. Now, there was at one point, I remember we had a discussion, multiple discussions actually, uh, where we asked the users uh, whether they use the internet. And many said no, but the same users were asked whether they use, the, use Facebook, and they said yes. So <clears throat> relevance matters, right? For adoption, is it relevant? Is internet relevant for people's uh, lives? Facebook seems to be more relevant than internet, so to speak, but nobody really cares that Facebook rides on internet. But Facebook is important for communication, for publishing, uh, product information for Facebook commerce and so on and so forth. So I think what why is internet important for me? I think that's that's something that we have to really 
answer to the lens of specific persons. So when we talk about financial services, which has taken on a life of its own in Bangladesh, as you know, had a huge growth. Uh, we've had a, a uh, growth of huge growth of educational content. Uh, why? Because our schools were closed during COVID. So it was mandated by COVID. We had, I will talked about the health services. Uh, for the first time, I think at scale, we offered health services over the internet and over the phone uh, because we had to. So it was facilitated by COVID. So COVID actually showed us possibilities that existed, but we were not aware of. So COVID without design actually created an awareness that we were not able to create by design. So I think we should take lessons from that and design our awareness programs for behavior change. Uh, right now, the way we do awareness programs, both public and private, I think is untargeted. Uh, we've had a number of Bangladesh boasts a number of very, very deep uh, awareness development programs for behavior change. We've had, we've done it for family planning. We've done it for Orsaline over the decades. We've done it for women's empowerment. So I think we need to take a very nuanced approach to awareness development. <clears throat> now let me talk about the second thing, which is skills development. Very similar thing. Julian, you said the skills must be learned. Of course, skills must be learned, but skills also need incentives. Why do I learn a particular skill? Why should I learn? So let's talk from the perspective of a user. Let's say a student needing to pass an exam, a pregnant woman needing antenatal care, an elderly person who gets social safety net allowances from the government, which has become more and more digital, a farmer needing timely advice for the right insecticide at the right amount to use at the right time. So when we talk about these uh, skills, financial services, education, health, agriculture, we cannot talk in general. We cannot talk about uh, digital skills for education. I think we need to talk to the lens of a particular user and understand his or her particular usage model and design skills development in a targeted way. That's what we do in the non-digital space. I mean, when we do skills development, we understand the needs of the user. And I think we need to do similar things for the digital space, for the mobile space as well. So think about entertainment. A lot of you have talked about entertainment. That does not need a skill because it's non-interactive. You just turn on YouTube and a lot of our garment workers without much skill, a lot of our house help without much skill are really actually using the internet for entertainment. Why? Because it's just simple to use. So now we need to take the same simplicity uh, uh, for skills development in other areas. So when we talk about financial services, education, health, freelancing, I think we need to look at it from the perspective of user, as I said, not in general. So we, we, we that is, that is, I think, where we are, I think, not paying enough attention. So go deep, go, go to the nuanced approach. Uh, from the government, uh, we are uh, partnering with a number of private sector partners, uh, telcos, certainly Facebook, Google, and uh, we're trying to understand the skills needs and designing skills development for that. Uh, the last point that I wanted to talk about is skills must be coupled with design of content and services. So since we need to take a nuanced approach, so how we design content, how we design services, will also have to be from the perspective of the users. And that's where just uh, general skills development will not work. It has to be done understanding the needs of the users and designing content in a very specific way so that we know we don't need much training to use that content and services. So we have about a thousand services from the government that have been digitized and that are available over mobile phones or internet or mobile internet for the to be very specific, land records, birth registration, passports, so about a thousand services. We're uh, going to do another thousand plus services by the end of this year. But we have not done enough targeted awareness development for these services. We have not done the right skill development for the services to be accessed properly. They, the services exist, but not being used properly. So there is that coverage gap as well. So I think we need to be more nuanced. We need to be more targeted. We need to understand the user's needs very deeply and design content and services with that in mind and develop awareness and skills with that in mind as well. Thank you. Thanks, Amir. Um, I think that that uh, point you make about the lens of the, of the user is incredibly important. Um, we're going to turn it over to Tamir now then. Um, 
Pemi, you've already talked about the the efforts and, and a lot of the work uh, that you've been doing on and the issues you're facing um, digital skills. I suppose maybe now just uh, shortly, you know, give me a summary of what you see the challenges of trying to implement some of these initiatives and what support do you think is needed to scale interventions across the whole country? And often scale is often uh, a, you know a big issue with digital skills when, when dealing with individuals. So what are you seeing as the, as the big challenges and what support could we um, bring together to help those interventions? I, I think Anubhai was uh, you know pretty on it uh, that uh, we have not been able to really uh, make digital awareness huge. I think that's something that where we need to work together. Uh, not only us will not be doing. We have to work together with the government in how to really, um, for example, ensure the people that you know um, this this services are safe. Uh, this can be properly done and the how which services will be relevant for which people. I think that's something that I was thinking that we should be uh, having targeted audiences, like to know on targeted services. I, th I think that's something that, uh, that that we could do all together. Uh, that Onimbai said that we are pretty good, for example, uh, the sanitary services and all those other services that we really focused on the relevant people and we succeeded. I think the same thing should be done uh, uh, together, uh, the industry and the government on this matter. Okay, fantastic. Um, I suppose then maybe to, uh, I'm going to pass to Jens. Um, I suppose as more and more people adopt the mobile internet for the first time, I mean it happens even in advanced markets, become unaware of the safety and security risks, and, and often this is seen as a, as a rising problem even in advanced markets, and it's especially relevant for children and, and more vulnerable uh, groups, uh, the users. So what do you see as um, how how do we protect people in this? You know, in this environment where we are trying to uh, get people connected um, and making sure they have the skills to keep themselves safe and secure? Yeah, absolutely, certainly. Uh, and I think also what we have seen during, during COVID is basically that on the one hand, we had the acceleration of the digital adaption, but on the other hand, also there was an increase of the digital divide. Right, that we have to bridge. And as uh, looking like uh, as Grameen for our position is that we, of course, strive to be a very inclusive partner uh, for building the skills and, and bridging the gap uh, for this divide. And for us, it's, it's important that we see that we invest in all the trainings, in the research, in the, in the capability building and doing this together with a partner. You think, because I think, like uh, Time was said said before, this is a this is a kind of mammoth task. It's very difficult to to stem it alone. So we are partnering up here to 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 get this, like we do with UNICEF for the online safety program. We do it. We have uh, ongoing research with um, uh, Plan Bangladesh for creating opportunities or removing uh, roadblocks for for girls in the ITC uh, ICT sector. Uh, we've recently signed a, a MOU with uh, UNDP on how to empower the youth. And uh, so partnering is, is one of the key topics that we see how to, to get it massive, how to reach scale here. And another important topic for us is, of course, and it was mentioned before, all these learning materials that we have for the safety, they, they need to have the right context. And they need to be adapt adapted to a local context, to the local language, to the local culture. There needs to be a clear reason to do this. And looking ahead uh, together with our partners, I think uh, we have to try to incorporate this uh, uh, child online safety, trying to get this also included into the national curriculum so that it becomes a standard topic. So all in all, I think very important to keep uh, vulnerable groups safe in the, in the ongoing digitalization. Great. Um, I mean, I think the, your comments there about uh, the importance of partnerships really leads me on to a question now for Otsuko then, is, uh, I mean, we've heard about the importance of the local, the user's lens. Um, uh, Jens and Tamir have mentioned a lot about the partnerships with public and private and, and non-government organisations. I suppose from your perspective and knowledge of the Bang uh, Bangladesh context, what are some of the best practice examples of digital skills and knowledge that you think we can still bring to, to Bangladesh and, and replicate in Bangladesh to, to advance the, you know, the digital adoption and digital skills? Thank you, Julian, for this uh, excellent question. And I would like to focus on uh, uh, the uh, special interventions, perhaps for girls and women, as uh, the previous speakers also mentioned. 
we believe that uh, they are a very important segment of society who can uh, be more involved and be an active producer of uh, information and data in the uh, the whole uh, Bangladesh context. <coughs> and as you may know, uh, ITU has been working with uh, private sector companies and other UN agencies and the government to organize a Girls and in ICT Day celebration every year. Uh, this year, the global celebration will take place on 22nd of April. So what happened is that uh, we organize a physical as well as virtual meetings to encourage young uh, women and girls to uh, take up ICT or digital technology as a topic of their academic career or to pursue ICT as a uh, professional career. And uh, last year, we had, because of the COVID, a series of virtual events uh, all over the world and in Asia and the Pacific as well. We organized a Girls in ICT Day celebration in Thailand for one week, oh, sorry, one month. Uh, it was opened by the uh, NBTC and the uh, Ministry of Digital Economy and Society, participated by about 300 girls and women from all across Thailand, uh, from the rural areas, uh, the girls with uh, disabilities, and the girls from special ethnic uh, uh, groups, as well as uh, in the south, in the north, and in Bangkok uh, included. What we did was that we encouraged them to take up a one-week special course. These are very short, foundational courses on specific important topics. So we had uh, AI coding for uh, beginners. We had an entrepreneurship for one week. We had a smart farming. We had cybersecurity and leadership. So the girls and women could take uh, virtually different courses to get exposed to different aspects of digital technology. And we had a conclusion at the end uh, in September last year. It was such a fantastic event because uh, they all came back saying that we learned something new and we want to do more of this. And we are not talking about girls and women in Bangkok only. We are talking about all across from different schools and even teachers participated. And out of this initiative, um, we had an opportunity to talk to a uh, vice minister of education and she wanted to do boys uh, in ICT Day celebration in Thailand as well. And she also said that we now um, need to upgrade the uh, technical curriculum for vocational schools and technical schools in Thailand because she saw the value of this event or such event to really upscale and upskill the, the Thai students so that Thailand can become the digital hub of the whole ASEAN sub-region. So I believe that, uh, Julian, that these events, which may be targeted at specific vulnerable groups or sectors, could really scale up to reach the national development goals. And I hope that um, this conversation with Ministry of Education will really um, go further so that this will have a multiple impact uh, long term and perhaps more widely, which would affect different sectors. So thank you, Lilian, back to you. Thanks, Africa. I think that's very encouraging and uh, um, a warm sort of example of, uh, of what can be achieved. And I think it uh, resonates well with Jens and Tamir's comments before about, and, and Nia's comments about the education system and, and getting skills um, as part of the curriculum. So finally, uh, maybe before I, just to hand over to Ania then, with a question around, you know, we've, we've seen, uh, we've heard a discussion around the whole of government approach to this, and I suppose uh, Atsuko's comments and the comments before really um, encourage the whole of society approach into innovation ecosystem, to education, um, to address the digital skills gap. It says, how will the government support collaborative action within the ecosystem of digital knowledge and skill players going forward? Thank you, Julian. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, whole of government approach and whole of society approach are definitely needed. needed. Um, <clears throat> again, if you look at it from the perspective of uh, skills and knowledge and awareness, uh, Ministry of Health needs to be involved for health services. 
and Ministry of Health needs to work with uh, the telcos, uh, the large technology providers such as Facebook and Google uh, to actually not only educate uh, the consumers, the patients about how to access mobile health services, but also the doctors to educate them how to provide that because I think they need more training. Similarly, Ministry of Education needs to work on developing the skills of the teachers. I think that is more needed than the skills of the, the students who will learn on their own, as we have seen, because they have, uh, I think, quicker learning capacity, as we have seen at, at a certain age. So I think uh, each ministry needs to take an approach. Recently, we have started working uh, with uh, all the ministries on fourth industrial revolution skills. <clears throat> So this was an initiative that we uh, launched from cabinet division. The cabinet secretary himself is chairing it. Uh, so that's looking at far more advanced technologies such as the merger of biological, digital, and uh, the physical realm. So if we sort of talk about how to use internet, how to use uh, potentially when 5G will come, IoT will become a significant issue in agriculture, in health, in education. So so I think that the, the, the world is moving very, very fast and we need to keep up with it or at least, or rather, uh, lead it, lead some of these evolutions. And that will require a whole society approach. Uh, for M-Commerce, SME Foundation needs to be involved, more involved. I mean, it's already involved. So I think uh, when we talk about the whole society approach, again, a very nuanced, very targeted approach to what, what it is that we're trying to accomplish for specific user groups by the service providers. The chambers of commerce and associations, they need to be involved far more deeply about how they want to equip their small and medium enterprises and the cottage and micro enterprises to become more and more digital lifestyle oriented. So I think they're doing financial transactions right now, but how do they promote their products? How do they actually do uh, a supply chain? How do they actually uh, uh, get uh, the whole uh, products from within Bangladesh and uh, from outside of Bangladesh? So I think. All these things need to be worked out in a very deep manner. And the last thing I'll talk about, and I'm sure our Honorable Minister will, will, will talk about this, <clears throat> is uh, something that we touched on end of last year is broadband as a human right. So some countries have already uh, explored this, have established this to some extent. We would like to do this in Bangladesh. This is a long road. We understand that. This is something we discussed with Anju and her colleagues in Alliance for Affordable Internet, that what does it mean for Bangladesh if you have to establish broadband as a human right, where we provide uh, our basic services, education, health, uh, agriculture, disaster management, over the over broadband, not just a low, uh, uh, narrow band internet. Uh, what does it mean for us and how do we ensure it for every uh, every uh, population leaving no one behind. I think Atsuko talked about uh, women and girls. So they are often left behind. And that's why I think she harped on that so much. So not only just women and girls, but persons with disabilities, uh, elderly, uh, uh, the, the marginalized, the indigenous population. So covering everybody so that we don't leave anybody behind. I think this is a uh, vision that we want to establish in Bangladesh. Our, our Honorable Minister is uh, very keen on it and we need to work together with this whole of society approach to establish that as well. Thank you, Julian. Thanks for the comment, Anir. I think um, that sort of gives a nice sort of summary to set me up for a final question for all the panelists. But we've all been speaking about the partnerships and, and the initiatives that you've all been championing or, or observed. And I think um, we can clearly see that you, you're all champions and committed to the cause. So looking forward from a collaborative point of view of the people on this call, um, what steps should this group take over the next 12 months to increase digital knowledge and skills? Because we're all working in our separate champions um, approach. So is, is there something we can do together, um, the people on this call, to advance over the next 12 months? And who else would we need to involve in those initiatives? open the floor to any one of your panelists perhaps uh, yeah maybe good. maybe let me yeah. Yeah, let, maybe let me uh, get it a start because uh, i think anir already put it very nicely on it when he said all of the ministries right everybody and it's not only the government it's 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 all of us this is 
this is really a tremendous task ahead of us, especially for, for all the skill sets, getting it up, getting it fast up. And, and I think, of course, it's the private sector playing here uh, a, a tremendous role as well in the leadership. But without the help of all the ministries and all the government entities, it will be very, very difficult. So I think this is a task where even we can prove that uh, NGOs, government entities, private sector can work hand in hand where we have one aligned goal, working for it. So I think uh, it was without now pointing out a single how we can how we can dedicatedly collaborate. But I think this is a task where we need to work hand in hand all together. And this is such a fantastic task because there's there's such a fantastic potential at the end that we can achieve that we should do so. Great comments there, Jens. I think yes, the, the national treasure that can be uh, grown from uh, digital skills and digital inclusion. Absolutely. In the COVID period, Pamir or Atsuko, any any final comments on, on what we can do together? I think uh, based on what Jens just said, uh, the ministries are being activated uh, because it is the digital Bangladesh year, and a lot rides on what we do this year. The whole nation is looking at us. So I think when we talk about all of us should do it, I think we also should, should talk about, as Julian, you put it, what each of us should do. When we, when we talk about all, then it's a sort of an amorphous collective and we don't feel individual responsibility. But when we talk about each of us, I think we have to feel that individual responsibility. So uh, all the telcos are here, uh, the CEOs are here. So I think uh, if, if the CEOs make a commitment that they will pursue a particular sector or multiple sectors. So let's say one could say, I will, I will particularly work on health. I will particularly work on education, disaster management, agriculture, women's uh, empowerment issues, financial inclusion. So I think we could take on an area that is also linked to the business growth that we want to see. Uh, I'm talking on behalf of the, of the CEOs. And that makes business sense as well. It cannot just make CSR sense. It has to make long-term business sense. If that can happen uh, from A2I, since we work with all ministries and uh, recently we've started working with 40 chambers of commerce and associations on specifically skills development and particularly focus on digital skills development, I think we can facilitate dialogue and partnership. So if we make that commitment, I think that, that way, I mean, we are already doing it for a fourth industrial revolution and uh, <clears throat> mobile is a very significant aspect of that. We can facilitate a lot of that, a lot of the dialogue, and also with the development partners. I think Jens talked about what he's doing with uh, UNICEF and UNDP. So hopefully, we will see whole of society collaboration across the board. Thank you very much. But again, focus is important. And it's a great invitation, and uh, I'll let them uh, take that conversation further after the after the call. Um, I'll leave Atsuko and Tamira. Uh, Thank final you. Comment. What we do next? Thank you, Julian. I would like to propose what uh, um, I was saying earlier that perhaps um, we can also target at specific groups such as uh, the girls and women or people with disabilities. And if uh, they are interested, for instance, companies uh, among these uh, participants will be happy to organize a similar Girls in ICT Day celebration targeting at girls and women in remote and rural areas and organize a short introduction courses so that um, they will be interested in using the technology and to be uh, a part and parcel of this uh, evolving uh, digital economy and society. And uh, we'll be happy to work with uh, um, the ministry as well as uh, Mr. Daniel Chaudley and of course Julian uh, with uh, GSMA so that this can be um, uh, a pivot uh, and event where uh, a lot of things happen uh, afterwards and I hope that the usage will expand <laughs> rapidly. So uh, I would like to propose that we, are, we stand ready to, to support any of uh, these initiatives to expand the digital inclusion in remote and rural areas. Thank you, Julian. Thanks, Atsuka. I know we'll be on a call soon then to discuss this matter further. Um, I'll leave final comments then for Tamir. Now, I think uh, Jens and Anirbhai, they also mentioned that, you know, for this to happen, we all have to work together. 
I think the COVID year uh, 2020 that really showed that we can actually work with the government. I think uh, with Anil Bhai, we had lots of projects, uh, you know, for tracking and all these things. And we did have different areas of things different people are doing. So we can actually make that happen if we, even if, if we really want to. And of course, Anil Bhai also mentioned, should also have some business sense, but um, I think that, that comes automatically. I think that's something that we know. And um, again, we, uh, we can work on, with the government in the future, uh, with everybody together. We can focus on specific segments. That's something that we can always work. Absolutely. Uh, great. I think those um, uh, in those final comments are a few tangible uh, outcomes and next steps uh, for a conversation. And I know. Um, yeah, could, could I have 30 seconds if, if you allow? Sure. I mean. Thank you so much. I, I just have to thank uh, uh, several of the panelists here, particularly Jens and uh, Azman Bhai from Gramin Phone, Matab Bhai from Robi, Tamur Bhai from Bangla, Ling Shah Bhai from uh, uh, Teletalk. Because of the great support uh, they provided during the COVID timeframe, we developed a syndromic surveillance system which allowed us to track disease progression seven to 10 days in advance at a time when we did not have enough RT-PCR labs. And that helped Ministry of Health uh, target health interventions. And now that we are in the second or the third wave, I don't know what to call it, I think similar systems may also be needed again. And uh, I had a call uh, with the four CEOs last week and uh, we are seeing similar support. And that all, all of that effort was guided by BTRC and our honorable uh, minister, telecom minister, because without his support and guidance last year, we would not have gotten the support from the telcos. So I just want to thank again that whole of society, public private partnership at a time of crisis was absolutely obvious that this is something that we should continue going forward. Thank you very much again. Okay. Well, thanks for those final comments. I think um, that rounds it out really the encouragement of actually the people present on this call shows the, the commitment of the industry and the commitment to collaboration with government and other private sector. So with that, I'd like to thank the panelists for the comments today. Um, some great insights and personal stories. You know, I really think that highlights the energy and commitment. I know the, my team will be um, certainly meeting myself with uh, various people over the next couple of days and weeks um, to take those uh, steps and the suggestions forward. But now, um, after final thank you for the panelists, I'd have the pleasure of introducing the Honourable Minister. Safa Java, um, Minister of Posts and Telecommunication IT, for his chief guest remarks. And uh, over to you, Minister. Oh, I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Okay. okay. Oh, there you go. Thank you, William. Uh, it's really uh, very, very important session we have passed on. I first of all just say good wishes to all the panelists, all the discussions and the presenters. The 100th year of uh, Father of the Nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and also the 50th year of our independence and definitely 2020 and 2021 is very important for Bangladesh. The whole nation is celebrating these two occasions. But Corona, in fact, could not allow us to celebrate it the way we wanted to do. On the other hand, I like to thank GSMA for organizing such an important round table. And with what I have heard in more than one and a half hour, almost one hour, 49 minutes. It was definitely a good knowledge for me. And I got a better understanding about the digitization process, the role of our telcos, 
and even the device manufacturers. It is an excellent decision to organize such roundtable and excellent discussion about the whole issues. I think in a very short time, all of our panelists has discussed most of the relevant issues and addressed the problems and also suggested the solutions of the project. I really feel that this is a opportunity where we can express our actual situation to all of you who are attending this round table. As you know, Bangladesh started its mobile age in 1989 with CDMA technologies and our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina he converted that technology or a monopoly mobile provider to the DSM technologies and four licenses were issued in 1997. So in fact, if you just talk about the history, the beginning of the mobile technology is from 1997. So if we count it, then it goes to 1989. Even though you will understand that the people were just using mobile technology, replacing the fixed phones, and they were enjoying the freedom of speaking from anywhere to anywhere. And mostly uh, this is a voice technology and until 2013 we were just in 2G. From 2013 we were in 3G and we had to wait till 2018 when we entered into the 4G penetration and you know that one year, that is 2020 until now, was not the appropriate time for expansion of technology. And the responsibility came to the mobile operators where more than we could think of. As Anir has mentioned, suddenly we discovered that one of the major strengths of fighting COVID is the mobile technology. And he has mentioned some of the efforts that our telcos has provided. I like to thank all the operators that the support they have given during the COVID period was extremely commendable. And I appreciate that even without asking any question, they just listen to us whatever we say. This is something that indicates the intention of our telcos that they are serving the nation, they are for the people, and business is not only their motive. I remember when I just talked to our telcos that you have to immediately make certain calls toll free. And Anir has mentioned that you have to provide data for recognizing COVID patients. 
and I really appreciate what they have done in the Corona period that the whole network was working 100% perfect. I know some of their workers had to take risk of their life to protect the people of our country. This is something which this country needs. Anil has mentioned some thing that what they did. I can simply say that the corona period has expanded the horizon of our digitization process. In fact, we are working with the digitization process right from the declaration of Digital Bangladesh by our Prime Minister on 12th of December 2008. But we were working, Anil knows, and I myself, the private and public sector was working with the ICT technologies, which can change the society, which can change the government, which has changed the organs of the government. And we were rightly thinking that digitization is their future. You know that when in 2008, nobody thought of digitization, also nobody termed their country as digital country. And the concept of fourth industrial revolution came only in 2016, Bangladesh started their work very seriously after 2009. And today, Anil has mentioned that already 2,000 government services are provided to the people and more 1,000 is coming by this year. So is, this is a great achievement for Bangladesh because Bangladesh was born as an agro-based country. We missed three industrial revolutions and we are so much behind in technology. I always give an example. Printing machines were invented in 1454 in Germany and it came to Bangladesh in 1778. So you are lagging behind 324 years for getting a printing technology. And the situation which was in 1972 was such that you remember the US Foreign Secretary termed it as a bottomless basket. And to turn it, into today's position as a developing nation, Bangladesh has definitely worked in such a way that the dream of a developed country and a knowledge-based society or riding the fourth industrial revolution is definitely achievable and not only we this is the recognition we are getting it from all over the world particularly by this time when we are celebrating the 100th year, birth year of our father of the nation and the 50th year of independence Recently, we had 10 days of programs where our honorable foreign guests were here, head of states or head of governments were here. We also listened to the best wishes provided by the world leaders and the appreciation we got was definitely noteworthy. 
in this circumstances i can just mention here that today whether we have gone to the maximum limit of 4g it is very important to inform you that during covid time 70% of our covid patients staying at home they got the treatment from the doctors and sometimes internet mobile internet that is something which we can just really celebrate that now in fact as the figures were mentioned here 95% of the country or the population is under 4G and 98% of the land is covered by mobile i like to thank the operators because i could just request them at the middle of last year that what i feel you have to go to all over the country and convert your 2g 3g bts to 4g i have heard that 100% of the bts of gramin phone and also 98% of robi has been converted to 4g that is a great achievement within such a short period and i am sure same case is happening with bangla link and teletalk this is something i must praise and the discussions you have made i can i would be happy to address all the issues discussed but because of time frame i will not go in details but i'll mention some of the issues that i think the telcos realize that the government is friendly to them we listen to them we work from them we just remove all the hindrances they face and whenever they put some suggestions i think as a minister i myself my division and btrc in particular take it very seriously and try to solve all the problems one of the issue i like to mention here that today i am really happy to know from the fair go that bangladesh produces 85% of its need of 4g phone sets and that is because of the wishes of the government i must thank our past finance minister abul mal abdul mohit and i remember then i was not even a minister i was just simply a president of a trade body went to him and requested that bangladesh should become a self sufficient country which can be done through producing assembling digital devices in bangladesh and he decided immediately by which today more than 14 factories are established here including international brands like samsung or oppo and there are few more who are just building their factories and i think by end of this year the penetration of our locally manufactured phone set will 
go up to 90 to 100 percent and for this reason though someone has mentioned that the duty structure is to be devised when we can produce in bangladesh why should i encourage the import of such thing because that will definitely a costly thing whenever the duty structure should be so we emphasize on the local manufacturing that not only creates the industrialization creates employment also reduce the cost of the devices and the proposals we have got today that the packages can be created and the uh, installment facilities should be given to many ways i just confirm that we are ready to work in every way our manufacturers uh, and the calcos want to do want to work and i really started the job in fact i remember that i talked to an university vice chancellor that he will be giving sets to the students for their education and that will be provided by uh, uh, installment so these things are here and in fact we take everything into note which is provided by the telcos suggested by the telcos or we have am job here also i have taken note of all the suggestions made here in this round table i appreciate the report that has been created and the practical side of it is definitely not worthy so i really appreciate that gsma has taken the uh, pain of organizing such a round table and people from many countries has participated here and i really say again we provide we just express our best wishes to all the participants and i uh, think you will be doing same kind of things preparing reports and definitely suggesting to us what can be done and what should be done your suggestions will be welcomed always thank you very much thank you again joy bangla joy bangabandhu thank thank you very much your excellency for your kind words of support uh, for the mobile industry that, that is the digital engine of digital bangladesh uh i i'm sure you know all of us would like to work together to convert the potential energy we see here into some kinetic energy uh into some action uh soon so we will be reaching out uh, in in the near future uh i will now invite uh, brigadier general sm farhad uh, the retired retired uh, secretary general of uh, amtop to deliver the word of thanks and before that uh, farhad bhai thank you again uh, for amtop support in everything in organizing this event over to you farhad bhai uh farhad bhai can you hear us uh, you may be on mute yeah, please go ahead i think you're you're on mute now uh farhad bhai we can't hear you can you uh, just mute yourself once and unmute again no unfortunately i think 
we're having some difficulty there, maybe a technical glitch somewhere. Uh, maybe I will then just uh, quickly thank all the participants who've come here and given their time to this uh, discussion. As I was saying, you know, there's a lot of potential. We've discussed lots of potential actions, uh, what we would like to take forward some of these and, uh, you know, realize, uh, realize the goal of Digital Bangladesh. So with that, I'll just uh, say thank you to everyone and uh, wish uh, you all good health in these times. Uh, thank you for joining and thank you for your time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Raul. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, GSMA. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Raul and GSMA. Thank thanks, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Yeah. Thank you, Rahul. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for you joining. Yeah. Thank you, Rahul. Thank, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Rahul, great moderation. Julian, thank, thank you for the good moderation. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thanks for the support.